Now, from the earliest of times, the Lord has instructed children to honor their parents. You see, it's to begin then. Teach a child the way that they should go. And when they're older, they'll not depart from it. This, I think, is one of the big problems in American culture today, is a failure of parents to teach children right and wrong. To scold them when they do wrong. Oh, you don't do that. I mean, I've seen parents let their children go completely berserk in department stores, and oh, they don't want to correct them. They don't want to hurt their feelings. But meanwhile, they're doing everything but assaulting the shoppers in the store. Church, it has to begin then. This begins in childhood. And remember this, no matter how old one becomes, they're still their parent's child. <laughs> you never not become your parent's child. L listen to this. This is the fifth of Ten Commandments. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Church, that's the fifth commandment from Exodus chapter 20. Honor. In the very beginning, when the Lord was establishing order on the earth, he commanded, this was a commandment, these weren't the Ten Requests. These are the Ten Commandments. Now this demonstration of honor required by the Lord is intended to benefit everybody. It'll benefit the child, it'll benefit the parents, and it'll benefit the culture in which they're raised. Listen, it's repeated again in Deuteronomy, but this time it's even a little better. Deuteronomy 5 and 16 says, Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Now listen, that thy days may be prolonged. Now listen, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Friends, this is the heart of your father, your heavenly father, that life be good for you, that things go well for you. Does that mean that you'll never have any difficulties? Certainly not. This isn't talking necessarily about the whole trip. It's talking about the destination. Amen. Church, the Lord's heart is to bless you. Amen. That it go well with you. That things be good in your hearts, in your homes, and in our nation. But it seems, however, that modern society has entered into a season of self. Unlike anything we've ever seen before, many have no regard for anyone or anything that doesn't line up with their politics, their opinion, or the way they see things. I mean, never before in American history has a sitting congressman been gunned down in an assassination attempt because his politics differed with the gunman's. Never before. This is a first in American history, and it's disgusting. We, we, we need to, this should be a real eye-opener. We can't just keep skipping along happily through life. Things are eroding right before our very eyes. Friends, this is not an isolated incident either. This is far more extensive and far more extreme than you might think. Church, there's a vile spirit of hatred that's oppressing this nation. Friends, we need to look to the Word and we need to look to the life of Jesus, to see how life ought to be lived. Amen. You see, Jesus showed honor even to those that brutalized him, that mocked him, that scourged him, those that lodged false accusations against him. 
And he did it for our example, for our benefit. Listen, if you got your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, turn to Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to begin reading in verse 15. I'm reading from the Amplified. And I want to just give you a snapshot here of Jesus and the way he dealt with rejection and oppression and a difference in politics. In Matthew 22 and 15, it says, Then the Pharisees went and consulted and plotted together how they might entangle Jesus in his talk. Come on, let's foul him up good. We're going to trap him with his own words. Verse 16, and they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians. You know, the, you know who the Herodians were? The Herodians were a Jewish sect that agreed with the Romans that were in charge politically. Interesting. We live in a day of Herodians. They sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you're sincere. And what you profess to be and that you teach the way of God truthfully, regardless of consequences and being afraid of no man. For you are impartial and do not regard either the person or the position of anyone. Church, this was not true. This was a misperception. Verse 17. Tell us then what you think about this. Is it lawful to pay tribute levied on individuals and to be paid yearly to Caesar or not. They wanted him to say, no, you don't want to give anything to Caesar. So the Romans could seize him and kill him. Church, this is all part of an evil, murderous plot. But Jesus, in verse 18, aware of their malicious plot, asked, why do you put me to the test? And try to entrap me, you pretenders, you hypocrites. Show me the money used for the tribute. It's a good expression. We use that today. Show me the money. (laughs) Show me the money used for the tribute. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and title are these? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, pay therefore to Caesar, the things that are due to Caesar, and pay to God the things that are due to God. When they heard it, they were amazed and marveled, and they left him and departed. Church, this is the Jesus that you and I are to be representing in this world. We're to be showing honor and giving respect to others, whether you agree with them or not, whether they like you or not. Jesus demonstrated a clear honor of and respect for authority. And Jesus said, we need to respect that. And church, so must every believer today. You know, the problem today isn't a Republican problem. It's not a Democrat problem or a liberal or progressive problem. It's a rebellion problem. People don't want to submit to authority. As a kid, this was drilled into us. We were taught to respect our parents. We would never talk back to our parents. Or you'd Like Fred Sanford used to say, I'll give you five, cross your lips. If I spoke back to my mother as little as she was, she'd grab me by the neck and whack me right across the mouth. We were taught to show honor and respect. We were taught to respect our teachers. We were taught to respect clergy. We were taught to respect the police. We were taught to respect our elders. You didn't talk back to people older than you. (laughs) <laughs> when I was a kid growing up, I was a punk. And we hung out in a shopping center, a whole bunch of us punks. You know, just wise guy teenagers. 
And there was a policeman that the Suffolk County Police Department assigned to that shopping center. They put him on foot, which was pretty rare in those days out in Suffolk County. They put him on foot just to patrol that shopping center because of us wonderful children. And this guy had to have been straight out of the Marine Corps. He looked mean. He spoke mean. He had zero body fat. He, wa he walked like a, a wooden soldier, and he carried this big nightstick. And he took no nonsense. If we didn't move at the very moment he told us to move, we got a nudge from that nightstick. And if we still didn't move after that, we got a whack with the stick. I was a teenager. This was in the late 60s, I guess. Friends, within just a handful of years, these same police were being called pigs. They were being taunted, they were being challenged, they were being disrespected by a rebellious generation. Friends, this was just a symptom. The beginning of the end for respect for authority and the end of showing honor. At this time when everything had changed so radically, I was in college. Flags were being burned, undergarments were being burned. Anything they could do to thumb their nose at social norms and values. Church, in recent years we've heard of pastors being shot and killed, stabbed to death right in their pulpits. How far things have gone wrong. Teachers being assaulted and worse in their school buildings. Senators and congressmen shouted down in town hall meetings. They can't even speak. College campuses being burned, windows being smashed, cars being overturned. The president being mocked and depicted in all kinds of vulgar images. Disgusting things being said about his own daughter. Church, what is this nation coming to? We are seeing such an evil rebellion, such a demonstration of utter disrespect. Where has the honor gone? Church, things have got to change. Now, the Lord has opened my eyes to what's happening. Did you notice that the rage among some of these people is so out of control that they don't even, they don't even know what they're raging about? They're flipping out. They're spewing vile things. They're... I mean, disgusting things they're saying, and some of them don't even know why. They, there's a guy named Jesse Waters that interviews people on the streets. I don't know if you've ever, ever seen him. But he'll go up to like a young person and say, what do you think of Trump? He's disgusting. He's a bum. He's this. Why? Um, uh, um, what has he done? I, uh, uh, they don't know. All they know is that so-and-so said he's no good, so let's hang him. He's the president of the United States. There was a time those words would never be uttered. I'm not here to defend the president today. I'm here to defend honor. Amen. And what better day to do it than on Father's Day? Amen. Honor needs to be taught in the home. If the parents don't teach it, the culture is not going to see it. The Lord opened my eyes to what's happening. You know, when things get that distorted, that out of control, there's something behind it. And to understand what's happening in our present, we need to start by looking into our past. Let me start by saying this. Satan is a bum. 
<laughs> He's a bum. He's a thief and he's a counterfeiter. Now remember that he at one time was a ranking angel in heaven. Booted out because of pride. Now he knows from having been there that there are ranks amongst the angels in heaven. So the enemy has established levels of authority within the kingdom of darkness. Some to oppress individuals, others to oppress communities or groups, others to oppress much larger territories, even countries, even continents. I'm going to prove this to you. Turn, if you would, to the book of Daniel in chapter 10. In this book of Daniel, we're given great insight into such demonic oppression. And it results in spiritual warfare. In Daniel 10, I'm reading verses 1 through 13 from the Amplified. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it referred to great tribulation, conflict, and wretchedness. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three whole weeks. I ate no pleasant food, nor did any meat or wine come into my mouth, and I did not anoint myself at all for a full three weeks. Verse 4, on the 24th day, of the first month, I was on the bank of the river Hiddekel, which is the Tigris. I lifted up my eyes and looked, at, looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with pure gold of Uphaz. His body was, a, was a, a golden luster like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and his feet like glowing burnished bronze, and the sound of his words was like the noise of a multitude of people or the roaring of the sea. Wow. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision of this heavenly being. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. You getting a vision of this? This is heavy stuff. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me, for my appearance was turned to pallor, like color was just drained from it. I grew weak and faint with fright. Nine, then I heard the sound of his words, and when I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep, with my face sunk to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me which set me unsteadily upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And the angel said to me, O Daniel, you greatly beloved man, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For to you I am now sent. And while he was saying this word to me, I stood up trembling. Verse 12, then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your mind and heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come as a consequence of and in response to your words. Do you see the power of your words? Amen. Do you see the power of words spoken in humility Amen. to your God? He says, I've been sent in response to your words. But listen to what he says next. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. A prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him in the heavenlies. One of the ranks of demons is principalities. 
And if you do a study on a principality, it's an evil demonic spirit that has power or influence over a large area, over a nation. He says that this evil demonic thing called the prince of the kingdom of Persia was stood in for 21 days. They were doing warfare. For 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief of the celestial princes, he was the archangel in heaven, came to help me. Church, verse 1 reveals to us that this occurred during the reign of Cyrus. At that time, this Persian empire was the largest empire the world had ever seen. Greater than anything before it. It included parts of Northern Africa, all of the Middle East. It included parts of what are now India and Pakistan, north all the way to Turkey. It was huge. And the Persian armies were feared. They were barbaric. They were chopping off heads and limbs. They were known for inhumane brutality and ferocity. Friends, it was inhumane. It didn't, it wasn't birthed. This, this anger, this ferocity was birthed out of an evil spirit that had dominion over a territory, Amen. not in the hearts of men. Amen. That's right. This Persian empire was oppressed by an evil principality, a ruler of the darkness of this world. This prince over Persia is what opposed the archangel Gabriel to keep God's word from reaching Daniel. But. Capital letters. But. But God defeated. This evil. Principality. By sending Michael. The mighty warrior. Of, of the heavenly host. To defeat this prince of Persia. Church and he did. Now I believe that this is precisely what occurred in America in the late 60s and into the early 70s. As all morality basically disappeared. All values, mores, folkways of our culture vanished. People stripping off their clothes and dancing in the streets. Sexual morality was gone. The drug culture was here. The fires of hatred burned against all authority as rebellion reigned in this land. But church, God had a plan. The same way he sent the archangel Michael to team up with Gabriel and defeat the prince of Persia. God was about to defeat evil once again. And it came with the birth of the Jesus movement. This movement in the 70s affected millions of people. Millions were saved. Hundreds of thousands of churches established all over the nation and then all over the world. That still, many still exist to this day. Well, the Jesus movement started there too. It started where the problem was rooted and it worked its way across the entire nation until evil was vanquished from the land, until normalcy returned to the land, until the oppressor was defeated and his talons loosened on America. Friends, many churches and many believers today since the 70s, 
have seemingly lost some of their fire. They've seemingly lost some of their saltiness. And evil is again beginning to grip this nation. You don't need a PhD in theology to see it. Friends, a principality is once again burying its talons in the hearts of Americans. A spirit of division. A spirit of racism. A spirit of hatred, of anger, a spirit of violence that's setting American against American in an effort to neuter and destroy this great one nation under God. Where has the honor gone, you ask? The honor is being strangled out of this nation by demonic powers. So I believe, church, that as some say, history repeats itself. As Michael and Gabriel defeated the principality over the Persian Empire, as the Jesus movement drove the rebellion of the 70s from the land, I believe the Lord is about to release a heavenly assault known as a revival. Amen. It's coming, church. Okay. Amen. This revival is coming to purge this nation of the evil that's been oppressing us and dividing us, afflicting us with its evil brand of hatred and anger and violence. Friends, it's time. It's time for the restoration of respect and honor in our nation. And church, we need to let the revival begin right here in our hearts. Friends, the Lord made this great nation. And the Lord will preserve this great nation until Jesus returns. I want you to hear these lyrics of America the Beautiful. Joel, stand with me. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, listen, God shed his grace on thee. And crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Praise God. Church, as revealed to us by the prophet Ezra, that's who they believe wrote Chronicles. This is what it's going to take. He wrote in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people... That's you, and that's me. Who are called by my name, that's you, and that's me. Shall humble themselves and pray. Seek, crave, and require of necessity my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. 